Talking Tech, AI and Copilot X with GitHub CEO Thomas Domkey, C Sharp Dev Kit for VS Code, and some cool options for Mac users to play PC games. All that and more on this episode of The Download. Welcome back to another episode of The Download. I'm your host, Christina Warren, Senior Developer Advocate at GitHub, and this is the show where we cover the latest developer news and open source projects. Please like and subscribe. I have a cold, I apologize for my voice. It's Apple Week, AKA WWDC, and so I thought I would be cheeky by wearing a t-shirt based on Microsoft's ill-fated iPod competitor, the Zune. I didn't know if I should be mean about the Zune, I thought it might be too Zune. <laughs> So here's the thing, I'm an iPod person. I had a ridiculous number of iPods over the years, and I never even considered buying the Zune when it was a thing. But then in 2020, my friend Quinn Nelson, AKA Snazzy Labs, did a video on the Zune HD, and I got one off of eBay. It bricked my laptop, I haven't used it since 2020, but it was a neat device. Regardless, the irony of wearing this shirt this week just felt right, and so we're gonna be talking more about some WWDC stuff later. Also, earlier this week, I had a chance to interview my boss's 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 boss, GitHub CEO Thomas Domkey, and we talked about his experiences growing up in East Berlin, how he got into coding, his thoughts on GitHub Copilot X, and uh, AI, and, and stuff that excites him in the future. Check out some highlights. What was your access to, to technology like? I had a calculator. <laughs> I had a calculator. I couldn't. I couldn't. You know, you couldn't just buy um, uh, all the all the computers that came out uh, on the west coast. Um, there wasn't um, availability of Commodore sixty four or PC in, in East Germany. You couldn't just go to a store period uh, and and buy electronics, um, uh, even TVs and and cars. Actually, there's this. Um, you know, uh, the story from back then where you had to wait 15 years or 16 years for, for a car if you ordered it from, you know, the day you, you put yourself on the wait list until, until you got it. These days, you know, we are antsy of getting off the wait list after three weeks <laughs> on something. Uh, and if Amazon doesn't ship stuff in three days, uh, we're angry. Um, and so um, I, couldn't, I couldn't really buy uh, uh, stuff, whether I had the, you know, money or not. Um, and then... Um, I've discovered in school that the geography lab uh, had two computers in in the in a wall shelf, and so the teacher would let us code after school. And those were like East German made computers, clones of I think the Z80 or something. Um, and they had a cassette tape, and you would you know similar to Commodore 64, you would use Basic to to load software from those cassette tapes, and you could basically start coding. The cool thing back then was you didn't really need you know to download much. There wasn't downloading anyway. Uh, you had everything. Everything you needed to program the computer was on the computer and you would just get started. As somebody who is a proper nerd, like you've been coding since you were a kid, what do you think about this, this kind of new wave of, of AI and, and coding assistance? I think it's fantastic. Um, for me personally, it brings the motivation back. Um, as the CEO of GitHub, I don't have enough time for coding. I have to kind of like find the, the blocks where I um, have a bit of motivation and energy creativity to code something and then I can just open VS Code. I have Copilot chat on the site and I can start asking it um, as I did in Rio on stage. That was actually a real example uh, from trying out early prototypes of Copilot chat of asking it, you know, how could I build a snake game? Uh, I actually started originally with Python and I figured, you know, it's easier for the stage demo to do it in JavaScript because then you can just open a web page uh, and deploy it to, to get a pages. But yeah, I think it's, it's creating, you know, um, environment where everybody can um, start coding, uh, whether they have learned that 30 years ago, like me, or whether they just want to explore things and ask questions. And you get an answer, and then the key, the magical moment, uh, whether it's in Copilot chat or in ChatGPT, is that you can ask another question and another question. And as opposed to a search engine, where you always have a question and answer, and then the next question doesn't really know what you asked before, with, with, chat, with chat, you have this, tell me more. And then what other features can I build? And it gives you like a list of features and you can say, oh, give me more details on this. Um, how do I add, add obstacles to the snake game? And it might give you some code. It might give you some explanation or a mix of both. And I think that really, uh, you know, cr creates that uh, uh, um, creative energy in us. I know that a lot of people out there are going to want to know, how can they get off? Like, like, who do they have to kill? Like, who do they have to talk to? Who do they have to beg? Like, who do they have to bribe? How do they get off the Copilot X wait list? <laughs> well, they can just send an email to Christina and Christina will do her best <laughs> to get them off the list. Um, no, we are working. <laughs> uh, 
uh, joking aside, I think, you know, we, are, we, actually, we have been accepting um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people all of May, and we are going through the summer by adding more people. And so the best is, you know, to sign up for the waitlist um, of the different Copilot X feature that you're interested in and, um, and, and trust the system, trust the hubbers at GitHub, uh, the GitHub employees to accept you uh, as the go through waves. And, you know, it can't hurt to like, uh, to like the download and, and uh, leave a positive review. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Leaving positive comments down there, um, emailing me, don't email me, do not email Thomas. Um, you, I'm going to get so many emails now. I appreciate this. I, I, was, I was told that I was supposed to roast you and you just roasted me, which is honestly even better. I love this. I love this. Can't wait to see you again in person, but also see all the other cool stuff that, that you're working on and doing. So this is great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me or how we say giving you the upload. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> You can watch the full interview of me and Thomas on the GitHub YouTube channel. I've got you linked down below to see that full video. And look, no matter what Thomas says, do not email me about GitHub Copilot X access. I can't do it. Don't send me emails. All right, so WWDC, Apple's annual developer conference, was this week. And although most of the news was around Apple Vision Pro and Apple's view on spatial computing, uh, GitHub had some great Swift-related news this week, too. So GitHub Advanced Security now has beta support for the Swift programming language. And right now, code scanning support for Swift is in beta, as I said, and it's going to let users scan their Swift repos for potential vulnerabilities. And then later this month, we're going to be adding support for Swift security advisories, which will allow Dependabot to alert you about vulnerable Swift dependencies in the dependency graph. I know that Swift support is something that a lot of users in the community have wanted because many of you have told me, and I'm really, really excited to see this rolled out. Swift joins C, C++, Java, Kotlin, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, and Go as languages supported in our code QL scanning engine, which is great. And I've got a blog post and other details linked in the show notes and the description down below. Next, speaking of C Sharp, I want to give some love to the C Sharp devs out there. The .NET team at Microsoft just launched a brand new C Sharp dev kit for VS Code extension pack. And it basically brings really robust C Sharp support to your favorite IDE, which in my case is Visual Studio Code. So in the blog post announcing the dev kit and extensions, Tim describes it this way. The C Sharp dev kit is designed to enhance your C Sharp productivity when you're working in VS Code, and it works together with the C Sharp extension, which has been updated to be powered by a new fully open source language server protocol, LSP host, and that creates a performant, extensible, and flexible tooling environment that easily integrates new experiences into C Sharp for VS Code. The source repo for this extension is in the process of being migrated and will be available later this week. Um, so this extension kit includes the updated C Sharp extension, as I mentioned. There's also a C Sharp dev kit extension, and then there is an optional IntelliCode for C Sharp dev kit extension, which brings some AI power development stuff to the editor as well. And I think that this is going to be a really great option for C Sharp developers who maybe don't want or need the full power of Visual Studio. Or, you know, if you're on Linux, you now can get first party C Sharp support in VS Code. It's great. I want to give my congrats to the team on this because I know that they've been working on this for a really long time and we love to see it. So, in the show notes in the description, I've got a link to Tim's blog post, the extensions in the marketplace, and the GitHub repos. And now it's time for the GitHub Project Spotlight. And this is where I highlight a project from the GitHub community. And this week, I'm talking about Map of GitHub. And this is from GitHub user Anvaka, aka Andre Kashka. And this is a visual map of more than 400,000 GitHub projects. And each project is represented by a dot. And then the dots are in close proximity to one another based on their correlation with other people who have starred different repos. Not only is the end result really impressive, but I love how Andre outlined how he built the project. Really good stuff. Um, this is very, very good work. I, I love seeing this sort of visualization. I love this big data project, and, and I love it. So good job. And now it's time for my pick of the week. So as I said, WWDC was this week, and although most of the focus, as I said, was on that new $3,500 headset that I think I'm gonna wind up buying no matter how dumb it makes me look. My personal favorite announcement was kind of buried in the keynote and in some of the sessions, and that was that Apple is bringing DirectX 12 support to Mac OS, and they did it in a really clever way. So Apple has released a new game porting toolkit, and this is a way for game devs to basically see 
how their existing x86 games will work on macOS Sonoma using their Rosetta 2 translation layer alongside a fork of Wine, also known as Wine is Not an Emulator, um, and, and what they might need to do to get those games working on Apple Silicon machines. So essentially, Apple has created a translation layer that's very similar to Proton, which is a similar translation layer that Valve created for SteamOS as a way to bring Windows games to Steam and, by extension, Linux. And this thing from Apple is doing something similar, but it's also making it work on Apple Silicon machines, which is another layer of awesome. So as this exists right now, this isn't really a way for end users to play their favorite games on their Mac. However, thanks to a really great open source project called Whiskey, which is a modern wine wrapper for Mac OS built with SwiftUI, you can see just how good the game porting toolkit works out of the box, and it does work really well. So this is still in the early stages of development, and not all games are going to work or work well, but people are already successfully getting games like Grand Theft Auto V, Diablo IV, Cyberpunk 2077, and Hogwarts Legacy running on M1 and M2 Macs, and the more powerful the Mac, the better the performance. I've seen videos of people running Diablo IV at 60 frames a second on an M2 Max with zero effort, so like no changes needed. This is great. So expect to see more of these projects in the months to come. Um, I also want to say that the way that Apple added their patch for DirectX 12 support was really clever. Essentially, they added a 20,000 line of code patch to a homebrew file uh, in, like a, in like a diff file. It, it, it's bananas. I love it. Um, it's great to see. Let me know what you think of the Game Porting Toolkit or any of our other stories in the show notes and description. And don't forget to watch that full interview I did with Thomas. That's going to do it for me. If you liked this episode, give us a like on YouTube. It helps us out. And subscribe to Microsoft Developer for all your nerd needs. See you next time. <laughs>